there is <laughs> the, the presence of God here is heavy and thick. Um, we actually, I have some special new friends here. It's like nice to make new friends in life, isn't it? And um, they're pastors. They're just about to plant a church in Penrith. This is Luke and Tree. Why don't you guys come up on the stage? I know they didn't want this. Come on, you can do it. But it's, it's, they're just about to launch and plant their church in Penrith, so it's kind of a blessing. It's not very often that pastors can visit each other's churches because you're busy running and doing church. So when they said they were coming, I thought, what an opportunity that we could really bless them and pray over them. But do you just want to say hi? Why don't you say hi? Hello. How awesome is your church? How awesome are your pastors? How awesome is your worship team? You guys know how to worship I won't take up much time, but hello, I'm Luke. This is my wife, Cherie. We have the honor and privilege to serve God by launching a new church in Penrith. And uh, God's equipped us with a great team and great people and great extended family now. And, and I kind of include you as a part of the journey because we're here and we got to worship with you today and we're all doing great things. But we're cheering you on and we're really thankful and we're excited to see what God does this year. Well, I just thought if you guys want to stand down here and then anyone who wants to come and just lay hands on them and bless them in this moment, um, we just stand a bit more in the middle. There we go. Come around them. So I'm very bossy, aren't I? Um, thank you, God. Come, Holy Spirit. It is not a small thing what you were doing, planning a church. It is not a small thing in the eyes of God. God, I ask that you would anoint them. Lord God, you've birthed this vision in their hearts, but that you would anoint them right now. Lord God, for the calling. Lord, just these last two weeks preaching on Nehemiah, I pray for the spirit of Nehemiah to build, to be upon them. The tenacity that despite opposition, Lord God, despite setbacks, that the vision and the desire to build will be deep inside their hearts, oh God. I pray that you would give them true grit and strength in the Holy Spirit, Lord God, a strength that goes beyond the natural, a desire to see souls saved. I pray you give them an anointing for evangelism, not just within their own lives, but that they would raise up evangelists, oh God, everyone that comes on their team would catch that wind of evangelism, be able to lead people to the Lord weekly, bringing people in Jesus' name. We pray for the miraculous to be birthed in this church and we pray over Penrith, God. You love Penrith, Lord God, and we just pray that you'll plant them like that lighthouse in Penrith to draw people to yourself, those that are, that are looking, that are hurt, that are desire a heart change, Lord God, that they would find Jesus in that church, God, and bless their family. Let them have no need or lack or want for anything. In Jesus' name, does anyone have a word they just want to share? And Yeah. Um, I just had a word, and the word was even as a couple, that um, as pastors, that people will see the love that you have for each other, and that through this, you will see many um, marriages saved, and also, not just saved, but people that then re-fall in love with each other, when they see the love, I don't know either of you at all, but there's such a strong bond between the two of you, and God said he's going to use that in an amazing way where um, in your congregation there'll be so many marriages where they're set free of things and where they come together, you know, just as, um, as you bless them and as they see the love that you have for each other. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we are in part two of our Born to Build series. Don't worry if you missed out on the first one. It's like seeing the sequels. Some of them just stand alone. Hopefully, this message will stand alone. You don't need to have seen the first one to understand what's going on. But Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah is like the ultimate renovation rescue of the Old Testament. Does anyone enjoy The Block or any of those shows? Yes. Um, only like barely anyone, so maybe we need to like take another track. Uh, what about, <laughs> what is that other show? Uh, the Designs one. Grand Designs, that's it. I love Grand Designs. I used to watch it with my dad. 
And he would find it hilarious that every time, not funny that people would run out of money, but it's the same script, right? It's like they've got this gigantic plan. They're so, they're so, you know, confident in their selves. And then halfway through, they run out of money. And then they're so surprised and the bill gets extended. And my dad's like, it always happens. Why are we surprised? This always happens. Um, And he would just take great joy in that. But Nehemiah is the ultimate renovation rescue. It's God's people's version of the block. Um, And I'm going to pray in this moment just for your heart. This has got a mad wobble. There we go. That God would speak something fresh. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, now I just want to speak directly to people's hearts. Lord God, will we hear what you want us to hear today on this Sunday? Lord, would we have dreams? Would we have revelation? Lord God, would you just, even if people need to just rest and receive in your Holy Spirit, God, I give people permission to rest and just hear what you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview because I don't want to assume that we all know the book of Nehemiah because if we do Sundays like we assume everyone knows all the Bible stories and therefore I'm not encouraging you to bring people. So this church should be full of people that don't know their Bible. Do you agree that it should be a space that you can come in and not think they've just referenced a bunch of things I have no idea what they're talking about. So book of Nehemiah, in a nutshell, the people of God were conquered, taken out of their land. And when we say conquered, we're saying you know, really slaughtered, devastating, like a real devastation over the people of God, that their heart is broken. They've been taken out of of their, their promised land. And following that, they were conquered and taken to Babylon. But now Babylon had been conquered by Persia and the Persia king Cyrus decides to let God's people go. And they're able to return. That Prior to this moment in time in Nehemiah, they've had two returns. So people are like, dribs and drabs, making their way back um, to, to their homeland. And we find Nehemiah, chapter one, he's the king's cupbearer, which I just brushed on last week, is that it's actually a good job. It's not a bad job. Like serving the king, he was one, good looking, if that helps anyone in the room just get a visual picture for the story. Um, Nehemiah was good looking. He had to be a good conversationalist. He was a good guy. He had good relationship with the king. And his brother comes and says, what's, what's it like for God's people? Nehemiah asks, what's the state of God's people moving back? And his brother said, it's not good. Their walls are in ruins. Everyone's feeling flat and depressed. Their hearts are bleeding. He said, it's not good. Nehemiah, after finding out the state of God's people, his heart is grieved, like he's upset set. He begins to mourn. He's pushed to fasting and praying for God's people. He, he begins to fast and pray. And I highlighted last week that from the point of Nehemiah fasting and praying to the point of chapter two, him getting his opportunity to speak to the king was seven months. And the fact that sometimes there's a delay when God gives us a burning desire to do something and we think, I've got the vision, I know what I'm called to do, but then there can be a delay, a timing of waiting. So I spoke about us being ready and patient for us to build where we are. And I'm just covering some of my points because I will tie them together We need to expect opposition. When we have a clear vision from God and when we start to build in what God's called us to build, we will have opposition and we need to expect it because the enemy doesn't want you to build. He does not want you to build whatsoever. So don't be surprised when you start making the right steps in the right direction that you will get opposition. Doesn't mean that God is not in it. And then finally, I said God loves to use recycled materials, which is us. I'm like an, a nice bit of recycled timber. I love a recycled timber table put in once it's like polished up and put in a part of the structure. It just looks so beautiful. And that's our lives being redeemed. God is in the business of redeeming us like those burnt stones. So I just want to jump in. I'm going to read a chunk of scripture from chapter four and then flow into what God's going to say to us today. The enemies oppose the rebuilding. Sambalat, so this is Nehemiah 4, Sambalat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and he mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends, 
the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of those stones from the rubbish heap and child ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite who was standing beside him remarked, the stones of the wall could collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Then I prayed, and this is where we ended last week on that. Nehemiah prayed, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their heads. May they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not ignore their sin, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead, that the gaps in the wall were being repaired, they were furious. They made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem that to, and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. And there is so much rubble to be moved. I hate lifting, so I'd be in on that. Um, we will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. That's where we're up to in the story. Halfway up. When the, build, when the wall is halfway built. Do you remember that old Grand Old Duke of York song? Did anyone grow up singing that? The Grand Old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. They marched them up to the top of the hill, then they marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. Some people are giving me the strangest looks. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, they were neither up nor down. Halfway up is like a bum place to be. You're neither up nor down. It's the place where most people give up. You've been working with enthusiasm we had the vision, we know what we're doing, but now we're tired and we're only halfway built and we can't see the end of it. And not only that, the attack is becoming more and more real and the enemies are really closing in on us and we begin to hear the threats and we're believing what is said, that they're coming to get us and we are not, we have no defense against these people halfway up. It's a moment when you want to quit. It's the moment in the build, which I found out many of you don't watch these shows, but it's like they're nearly built and then they discover that there's an issue with the foundation and they have to go and like dig out the rock and it's going to cost $30,000 that they didn't have. To anyone who's built a house can totally relate. It's that moment where you find out there's something that you didn't know that's going to cost you money that no one will ever see. That's the moment Emma is laughing. Um, that is the moment that you think we're going to give up. We feel like giving up. This is the moment when you've been faithfully trusting God and the very things that you prayed would not happen have just happened. That is the moment halfway up. This is the moment that the qualities in Nehemiah's leadership really shine. When people start to complain. Up until this point, he had the people of God on his side. They were all building, building outside of their house. Everyone was chipping in, sons and daughters, all the relatives, everyone's a part of the build, but people are getting tired. And this is the first time in Nehemiah's leadership that he hears the people begin to complain. This is the moment many people would like to give up. When you hear people complain, you think, well, God, did I sign up for this? You've given me a clear road up until this point, and now everybody is tired. It's taking its toll. You know, it's one thing to be fired up and passionate about a vision. It's one thing to be moved by emotion and think, I'm stirred to do this and start this ministry. Many wonderful ideas are fueled in that very environment of someone's heart. But without a brick by brick commitment to the vision, such visions never make it past the inspirational stage. The brick by brick commitment of Nehemiah. 
Just his heart longing to see the wall built wasn't going to be enough. Just his desire to pray and seek God and fast, it wasn't going to be enough. For him to actually see that wall built was going to take actual physical effort. It was going to take personal sacrifice. It was going to take a commitment to the vision to face actual personal attack on him. There was going to be careful planning, physical endurance and courageous sacrifice. I used this quote last week, but I feel that it just spoke to me so much, and I think it speaks into this generation. In her latest book, Lisa Bevere writes, this book is without rival, trials have the power to transform us from who we are into who we long to be. But somewhere along the way, we picked up the lie that we could be heroes without engaging in battle. Trials have the ability of transforming us from where we are, from who we long to be. But somewhere along the line, we picked up the lie that we could be heroes without engaging in battle. It is an absolute lie. It's a lie, young people, that anything God calls you to, that it's going to be easy. It's, there's no story in the Bible that we read that. Like, look, Joseph, one of my best heroes, which I cited last week about his journey, every single person we can go along, everybody face trials. There's not going to be any victory without a battle. But we know that our God is the victorious one. So engaging in battle with him, he's had the ultimate victory. So it's a good choice. It's like choosing the winning team, which many people do. It's like come grand final, everyone's like, I'm in. I've been supporting them all season. Um, All of us guilty, 2016. I know there's lots of non-shark supporters out there, St. George people. Um, anyway, I'm not going to engage because I have zero interest in football whatsoever. It's not promised to be easy. It's going to require your personal gifts, the things that you're good at, engaging those things in the build. It's going to require physical activity. You're going to get tired serving and building for God. It's going to take personal sacrifice. You like... Nathan just said, it's going to take more than just giving when we feel like it on every level. There's times when we commit to build, we think, oh, I don't really feel like being on host team this morning. I don't, oh, what did you say? Boo. <laughs> Boo from the volunteers, pastor. Um, you don't feel like it, but building happens when you do it in spite of your feelings because you have that brick by brick mentality. It's going to take physical activity, personal sacrifice, and complete trust in God that the vision is from Him. What do you do when you are halfway up and it seems like the enemy is pressing in? I actually felt that for some people, this point, this main point is going to be just for you. And you're actually going to switch off for the rest of the service. That's okay. I give you permission. You are literally halfway up and you felt like giving up. And God's word to you this morning is this next scripture. Hebrews 12, 12 to 13. So take another grip with your tired hands. Strengthen your weak knees. And mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. You take another grip. What do you do when you're halfway up and it seems like everything is pressing in upon you? You take another grip with your tired hands. Nehemiah at that stage looked over the situation, called together the nobles, and this is what he said to them. Do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious, and you fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Don't be afraid of the enemy this morning, church. Do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember God, he is great and he is glorious, and you fight, and you take another grip with your tired hand, and you hold on and you commit to the build. Continue to build. Do not give up. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord and fight for your family. Second point this morning is build in spite of opposition. Last week I said expect opposition. 
that for many people, when the opposition comes, it almost, it terrifies you and stops you building. Just that attack, it's unexpected. We think, that's why I say to people, expect it. Even when someone makes a decision and they come forward at the altar call and they give their heart to Jesus, we try to say to them, look, don't be surprised, you know, if you feel like the enemy really comes after you because there's an enemy of your soul. We need to prepare people for those moments so they expect it, but so it doesn't like disarm them and they stop building together. We need to build in spite of opposition. And we give people courage and say, build anyway. With water baptism, you wouldn't be surprised with how many people that go to get water baptized and the enemy just comes in and attacks them that weekend. It's not for us to be afraid of. We just need to be ready to build in spite of that opposition, to do what God's called us to do when we expect it. We know it's coming and we call it out for what it is and we build in spite of the opposition. It's incredible people that are getting free and God's doing something and the very thing that's been holding them back, you, they get that phone call. They get something that happens and you think, that's not random. But when you know that it's the enemy, you just call it out for what it is and you build in spite of the opposition. When we're walking in God's way and we start to build according to his vision and plan, when you start to put your life into divine order, when you start to get free, take ground back off the enemy, expect that opposition. What do we do when we face opposition? Some of you are sitting there. You would like to know. Let's look at what Nehemiah did in 4.15. He said, when our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half the men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and the other hand holding their weapon. And all the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. And then just jumping forward to a few further verses, it says, During this time, none of us, not I nor my relatives, not even my servants, nor my guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. So we just got a visual of the stank on the work site. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. I cannot tell you, a few years ago, well, it might be a fair few years ago, we did our theme for the year was Nehemiah, and it was a scripture that we're going to talk about soon. Um, but this visual of working with one hand, like building with one hand and my hand on the sword at all times, has been something that has taken me through my Christian life. I've learned how to build and walk out my calling with God and I have my hand on my weapon always ready to fight and I'm building. I never stop building. When the enemy will always come and try to take us out, but we need to be ready. Our hand on the weapon is really the Word of God, isn't it? Having our wits about us when we have someone come in and go, you're not called, you're not supposed to do this. It's like, uh, block. That's a lie. That's a lie. Someone, my own voice inside me says, you're a loser, you can't do it. I'm like, uh, lie, no, block. That's what my hand on the weapon is. Someone, like, sometimes, <laughs> I have these weirdest moments when I feel like, oh, this is going to be a cracker Sunday or we're coming to church. I think I nearly end up in like four car accidents. And it's that day where, and it's not my driving, I think, where the heck did that person come out and feel it? Okay, God, I am a good driver. After I had three children, though, my driving record did go backwards a little bit. I've reversed into a few things. But it's a, it's a fully no credibility now with that illustration. Um, it's a devil, no, not today moment. That's when we're ready, when we're building, but we have our hand on the sword. But some people, you live your life and it's things that are happening to you and you just get tossed around all the time. You think, oh, God's not, ag not, God's not for me. He's against me and you're thrown around. Whereas when we're building and we have our hand on the sword, we go, I see what this is. I don't know when this attack's going to finish, but God is with me and I'm going through it and I'm going to continue to build no matter what, in spite of opposition. Tonight at the insul insulating insecurity, 
I'm going to insulate it. Um, Isolating insecurity. As I began to look back over my journey over the past 10 years of coming on staff and God, what he's done in my life, I was actually overwhelmed to see the amount of attacks that came on me to stop me doing what I was doing. But in the moment, sometimes you can't see it for what it is. And it wasn't until I looked back and realised there was all of these moments that the enemy was coming and trying to stop me from walking in the call that God had over my life. And I was quite overwhelmed because I thought, oh my gosh, like God is so good. He's so good. But when we're committed to build and we're just facing one at a time, we're going to come out the other end and see that God has completed the work that he intended to do. The thing with attacks is it comes from all directions. And the reason this series has been so relevant is we all suffer from insecurities. So the attack will usually highlight the insecurity. So then it all works together. And then personally, you start to self-destruct yourself, like the work has been done, if that makes sense. So a word gets spoken over your life, but then you take that on board and then you continue to do the rest of the work (laughs) within yourself of taking the lie on board. When I first got put on staff and I've shared this journey, um, in bits and pieces, just I, I never realised there was an issue with women being in ministry because I like grew up in such an incredible environment, home environment, um, that just always spoke well of people, just even church. Like my family, I never heard them speak bad about church, like in my home environment growing up in church. And so there was never that negative slant. And then Pastor Mark always gave equal opportunity to men and women. So I didn't realise it was an issue. I know, super naive, right? I get put on staff at a church and someone leaves the church because I'm a woman. That was my, I was like, oh, okay. Um, Not because they wish that I was acting actually a man, but you know what I mean. Um, that, and then it's somebody else. So just me overstepping into the call that God had over my life. Another person whose life was in compl- out of divine order said, she doesn't have enough life experience. She can't do this role. And just had a barrage of reasons why I should not be in that position. But that person's life was in, like out of complete divine order. But that lack of confidence in me was the enemy trying to chip away and to plant things in my insecurity. But do you know what we do? And I've learned this and I do this sometimes on a weekly basis, daily basis. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 4. For although we live in a natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energised with divine power to effectively dismantle the defences behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture it like a prisoner. I love it. I love the idea of capturing my bad thoughts like a prisoner. Every thought and we insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Do not be afraid of the enemy. Remember God and fight for your family. Take every thought captive. It's the weapons of our warfare. They're not physical. And I love this translation, the Passions translation, because it says the things that people hide behind. And sometimes things come, and if we take it at face value, I might think, oh, TJ hates me. And then that's the issue. The issue isn't that. TJ doesn't hate me. She loves me. That's why I picked her. Um... But the actual issue is the enemy's trying to chip away at me. And if I can see it for what it is, hidden under that, potentially hidden under her insecurities, I can fight it, take it captive, and it will not stop the build. Build in spite of opposition. Do not be intimidated. Do not stop building. Strengthen your grip and remember God. Point three, and it's like a bit of a side point in this beautiful book of Nehemiah. God is always rebuilding people. God is always rebuilding people. Chapter 5 in a nutshell, because I don't want to read the whole book of Nehemiah this morning. Read it at home yourself. That's your homework. Um, 
We've got Nehemiah. He has all these incredible giftings as a leader. And we think, yeah, he's visionary. Yes, he's got a plan. Yes, he can rally the troops. But then in this moment and in this chapter, we see the heart of God really in Nehemiah. The people begin to cry out and they say, there's some of us, our families are too big. We can't afford to live. We've got loans back to the Jewish people. So the rich people had lent the poor people money. They couldn't afford to pay their loans back. And so they're they're selling their children back into slavery, the ones that have just been released. And Nehemiah finds this out. He gets so frustrated. He says, I'm calling a town meeting. He gets everybody together in the room. And he says, how many times must we redeem these people? How many times must we go back and save them? Forgive them the debts, give them the land back. Why don't you release everything that they have and pay their interest back and let's just get on with the building. Nehemiah addressed a great um, oppression of people. He spoke for those that had no voice. In this moment where he didn't really have to, that wasn't a part of the plan. But when God is building, he is always rebuilding lives. And the result should always be that people's lives are rebuilt as a part of the process. So Nehemiah speaks up for the for the poor, makes them make a public vow that they're going to give all the money back. They do, and everything falls into divine order. But just as a side note, he says this, and character is never a side note for a leader. Integrity is not a side note. It is a foundation in which something healthy is built. Character and integrity. We need to look for that in our leadership. It's not just vision and can they build and can they do this and that. When you scratch the surface, is there integrity and character underneath? And when we do that for Nehemiah, he has a completely different leadership tone than what the people of God knew. He says, for the entire 12 years that I was governor of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of reign, neither I nor my officials drew on our official food allowance. The former governors, in contrast, had laid heavy burdens on the people, demanding a daily ration of food and wine besides 40 pieces of silver. Even their assistants took advantage of people. But because I feared God, I did not act that way. I also devoted myself to working on the wall and I refused to acquire any land and I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing, even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table, besides all the visitors from the other lands. The provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep or goats and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine, Yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy enough burden. Remember, oh my God, all that I have done for these people and bless me for it. This is the kind of leadership I had modelled by our founding pastors, Mark and Bron. Certain people think in leadership they should stop building. Everyone else should build the wall. Nehemiah said, I was committed to building the wall and I made everyone who worked with me, they built too. And though I was entitled to take things, I didn't because I knew the burden. That's also what I had modelled in the leadership beforehand, not putting a heavy burden on the church to think, well, you need to support me. These are my rights. It was within probably the contract. He could have required that, but he didn't. Character is a strong foundation He had God's heart for people and he not only built the wall, but he built lives as well. And that is our calling as the church. Our communities should be rebuilt just because we're here. Your workplace, the people around you should be rebuilt just because you're there. Your life is about building lives. People who are around you can't help but get built up because you're around them. That is our calling. We're born to build. We can't help but build up and encourage God is always rebuilding lives. And when we build with him, it always looks like that, the rebuilding of other people's lives. Families restored, rights and voices restored, all because we're here as a church. Point four, not every invitation and opportunity is from God. Nehemiah 6, the King James Version, conspiracy against Nehemiah. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the Arab, 
and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time we had not yet hung the doors or the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to me, they thought to do me harm. So I sent this message, message to them, saying, I am doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me the same message four times, and I answered in the same manner. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Following that, they send this open letters of lies, accusing him of all sorts of things. And he comes back to them and says, you know, that is absolute lies. Then someone else from the church tries to make a meeting with him. And then he senses that it's not from God either. And he doesn't make that meeting. You know, not every opportunity, not every open door is from God. When I first came back to church, I know this is going to sound super low grade to some people, but I was working at Funorama Indoor Party Play Centre paid me through my high school years as my part-time job and I'd left school. They offered me a manager's job on a Sunday when I just started coming back to church. It would have meant I couldn't make it to either morning or night service. That opportunity was more money because it's double pay because it's a Sunday than I was offered a position, a managerial position and you think that's a good opportunity. Is it a God opportunity? No. I said, that would have taken me out of church completely. The same thing happened. I was offered a scholarship for a film class on a Friday night. I, t- I actually did the film class for a while and stopped coming to youth. I was serving at youth and I did eight weeks of it and I knew I wasn't where God wanted me to be. When I tried to step away from the class, they said, we think you should keep doing it and we're going to give you a scholarship to do that class. It was a good opportunity. It was encouraging. I felt, oh, like that's pretty cool to be offered that. It wasn't a God opportunity. Felix, right before, I didn't ask if I can share this story. Here we go. Um, (laughs) I was planning on it. Right before he started working with Pete, which would have meant he'd be close to home, more available to be at church, he got offered this job, which was just like ridiculous amounts of money. But when we heard it, I said, I actually feel like this is making a deal with the devil. (laughs) I said, that's what I feel. Not that this lady was the devil, but I said, it just felt like it was so much not. I thought, this is not for our family. This is not for the house of God. But sometimes things present and you think, here's an opportunity, an open door. Not everything is from God. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Vicki Simpson posted recently, um, Who we had her a couple of weeks ago, she said, It looks like God, doesn't mean that it is. It doesn't look like God, doesn't mean that it's not. That is why we need the Holy Spirit's discernment. We need the Holy Spirit's discernment. We just sit on it, we pray. Sometimes you don't have that moment. In that moment, he knew. He's like, they intend to do me harm. Discern. He could have, if he was acting out of his own flesh, thought, well, the wall's nearly built. I'm just going to go and gloat, you know, and I'm going to say, ha, 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 look at what God's done. But that wasn't what God intended him to do. And so he sensed they meant him harm and he didn't do it. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. It's a thank you, no thank you. It's a thank you, no thank you. And I think even in my internal world, I translated that to when the negative thoughts, when I was battling with negative thoughts and they would come to entice me and tempt me to focus on everything that's wrong, I would say to those negative thoughts, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down to your level. I'm too busy building what God's called me to build. I cannot come down to where you are. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that you have to accept every opportunity, every door. You don't just have to say yes. You can be polite, thank you, no thank you. Doing a great work, I cannot come down. Right before the doors are hung, right before the work is finished, right before I was about to step back into church and the call of God in my life, right before the opportunity that we were going to be exactly where God called us to be, you get that letter, that invitation, that door opens, be wise, be full of discernment. Might seem like a good opportunity, but it's not a God opportunity. And then finally, 
And if Rick wants to jump back up on the keys. When we build with God, we're always engaging miracles. So I could think about because Felix is an architect and we're in the building world, it's like engage, you know, we need to engage a, now the word has left me, engineer, that's it. We need to engage an engineer. We need to engage these different people to do this job. A Tyler, when you engage with God and you build with God, you're engaging miracles into your build. Says in Nehemiah 6, 15 to 16, the builders complete the wall. So in October 2, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized that this work had been done with the help of God. 52 days. You can't get a one house built in this area in 52 days. Everyone, there's lots of people building at the moment. Can give me an amen. 52 days, you know that that's the hand of God is in it. And something that God brought me back to, how long did it take for Nehemiah to get his opportunity to talk to the king? Seven months, which is way over 200 days. They built the entire wall around a city in 52 days, which is half the time it took him to pray and wait for the opportunity to move forward. When we engage and we build with God, we engage with miracles. When you ask God to come in or when He's set a vision in you, you know, God loves to win a battle with a few. Gideon, He loves it. He actually loves to win a battle with a few. I think He loves to use a broken young woman to build a church because people think that must be God. That must be God. That's just, God has to only be in that. When you partner with God, with His vision, you're going to engage miracles. People devalue the Bible to just a good book of morals. They think, yeah, it's a good way to live your life. There's some good leadership principles there that you've shared in Nehemiah. Or you think, yeah, Jesus was a good guy. It's nice if you just live a Christian life. That's going to be a good way to live. But they actually undervalue God. When we just devalue Him to just some good life morals. When you're living your life with God, we have the breath of the miraculous. We have the God that created everything that we see at His Word. He has the power over life and death. When we engage with our God, we engage with miracles. So we take that vision and we commit and we persist and we're patient, we accept opposition, but we build in spite of it. We build where we are, we help the oppressed, we stand strong, and all of that is met with the breath and the promise of God. I stood back as I was looking at my whole journey And for them building, and there's no real points in Nehemiah, you think, oh, that's where the miraculous happened. We don't see, were they like speedy speedy bricklayers or something? We don't know. How did they do it? What What did the miracle look like? And sometimes when you're in it and when you're building it, you actually can't fully see that miracle. But you stand back and you look and you say, yeah, the hand of God and the miracle of God is all through that. And I think that about my journey. When I was in it and when I was doing it, I didn't realise so much about the the miraculous and what God was doing. But when I stand back and I look, I say, yeah, God was doing miracles. And right now, exactly where you're at, what you're building, some of you are just setting your heart on track with God and there's miracles for you in that season. Others of you are halfway up and God's just saying to you, there's a miracle and a portion for you to just keep going and keep building. Where is the hand of God for you this morning? On any given Sunday, He's right here. He's present. Would you all just bow your heads? My Lord, how much do we need His miraculous power? If the book of Nehemiah teaches us anything, it's sure there is action and things for us to do, but we need the hand of God. 
We need His Holy Spirit. How did Nehemiah tap into that power? It was a personal relationship with God. He just knew God. He knew that when he would pray to God, God would answer. He knew that when he was stepping in his ways, that God was with him. He was sure of that one thing. And as I close this service, I want to ask you, are you sure, first of all? Are you sure that you are walking with God? Do you know that you know that you know that you have Jesus in your heart? I'm committed in this church. You can get bored of it if you like, but God help you if you do. We're always going to ask people, is your heart right with Jesus? Are you right with God? Because we don't know how many days we have on this earth. We don't know. And I know that you are called to more than just sitting in church for a religious experience. God wants relationship with you. Do you have your heart right with God this morning? If you don't and you think, oh, I think I do or I'm not sure. If you've made this decision before, then be sure and be sure and be sure in your salvation. But if you've been away from God, if you've been distant from Him, if you feel like He's been reaching out to you in so many ways and you've found yourself in church this morning, then you need to make that decision. If that's you and if your life was to end tomorrow and you were to stand in front of God, You know, it's the lie that if we live a good life that we are saved because none of us are good enough for salvation. That's the whole point of what Jesus did, His sacrifice on the cross, that if we believe in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. He's the perfect sacrifice for all of us to have that access to God. You don't need to earn it. You don't need to do anything but believe it and receive it. Do you need to receive your salvation this morning? If that's you, I'm going to count to three with every head bowed and eye closed in this place. Don't let this Sunday go past without you making that decision. One, two, three. I want you to put your hand up nice and high if that's you this morning. Thank you, Lord. This is your one more moment. If you need to make that decision, we can wait. Is your heart beating a bit faster? I want you to put your hand up nice and high so we can pray with you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna pray for the rest of us now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've been here, God that you've been speaking to us and even sometimes it's just that one takeaway moment where there's people that are in here and they've felt under pressure. They feel like they're halfway up and they've lost sight of what you're calling them to build. There's others and the voice of the enemy has been so much louder than your voice of your promises. Lord God, I thank You that You have called us all to build. And I I release the awareness that we are building every day, wherever we are, that we are building up. We are building up for the Kingdom of God. There's some of you in this room and it's just a perception twist. It's a click that needs to happen where you think, I'm actually outside of what God's doing and God's trying to let you know you're absolutely in the middle of what He's doing where you are. And He's using you to build His Kingdom and to build others up. God, forgive us where we've torn down. Lord God, forgive us when we've contributed to the problem in our own lives. Lord, forgive us when we haven't built those up in our family. But I just encourage you now, God's forgiveness is there for you to just receive. Receive it and rest in it right now in Jesus' Name. Jesus' Name. How about we stand to our feet? The ministry team's going to come. If God's spoken to you about anything and you'd like to receive prayer, you're welcome. Otherwise, we're going to sing one more song as we close the service. Thank you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Though my days have been held in your hands. From the moment
moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, well, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am able Will I will sing of the goodness word for my tall friend behind Lee. If you want to just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's you. Yeah. Um, I had, God kept bringing you to my attention during the sermon, but as I stood down, I got this picture of you and the whole day I'm talking about putting armour on and being battle ready, but I saw a picture of you actually taking armour off and taking off these um, like physical things that protect you and just exposing your heart to God and being open to God and not having your guard up against Him and you naturally would have these things on that protect protect you from things that would hurt you but they've also put a wall up between you and God. And so I pray that as it's nothing that other people see, it's just something we, then we say, okay, God, I'm just gonna expose my heart to you, but he will always be good. And what he does is he's not gonna hurt you. He's gonna build you up and do everything that you want, God will do, and you will find it through him. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Awesome. Well, that is the end of the service. Come out tonight if you want a real exposing night tonight. It will be good. It has been. Bless you. And we'll see you guys at five o'clock. Your goodness is running out.